Our second reading this morning comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles in the first chapter, beginning at verse 15 to verse 17, and then picking up again at verse 21. Listen for God's word to you this morning. In those days, Peter stood, among the, stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's reading finds us in between the, the risen Christ, having spent 40 days showing up to meals and speaking to his disciples about the realm of God's power present in the world in light of his resurrection, has ascended into heaven, whatever that means. But at this point in the story, the Holy Spirit has not yet made its dramatic entrance for the day of Pentecost. That's next Sunday. Here we find the church in between. In between Jesus' ascension and the arrival of the Holy Spirit. We often like to talk about the Spirit as the life breath of the church. In the second creation story, when uh, God forms the human from the earth, it only comes to life as God breathes into it. And so it is with the church, which, which raises some questions about this passage and what takes place here. Ten days may not sound like that much time unless we're talking about breathing. Ten days without a breath would be the end of any of us. But then again, while Jesus had promised to send them the Holy Spirit so that in his words they would be clothed from power, from, with power from on high, it wasn't like a shipment from Amazon. There was no tracking notice to know when they could expect delivery. They didn't know it would only be 10 days. They were living in between what they knew, what they had seen and heard in Jesus, and whatever was next, not knowing exactly what that was or when it would be. Living in between can be hard. To live in between is to see in a mirror darkly. Far more is unknown than is known. It can be scary awkward and unpredictable. It can feel like we're stuck with no sense of direction. The most prominent story from the Bible about living in between is the Exodus. The people are set free from the yoke of slavery only to find themselves in the desert. They know that they've been promised a land, a destination, but they cannot see it. All they can see is the immediate crisis of being in the wilderness with no water and no food. Sometimes the word we use for this place of in-between is liminal. It's a word that comes from the Latin word limen, which literally translates as threshold. Life is filled with these threshold moments. 
starting from our conception until we arrive in the world. There's the moment we walk up the sidewalk to school for the first time, moving from home into the world. There's the moment that the church recognizes through the rite of confirmation when we mark the threshold on which childhood gives way to the beginning of adulthood. There's the moment we move from our home, the homes in which we were raised, to the homes we begin to create for ourselves as maybe a dorm room or a first apartment. We may move from life as a single person to life lived with and for another as a partner or a parent. Those are the thresholds of our personal lives. And then there are the thresholds of our professional lives, a graduation, a first job, a transfer that sends us across the country or across the world, a layoff, a career change, retirement. In many ways, our lives are marked, measured, and lived in between. In between where we came from and where we're going. What once was that's now gone and what is still to come but not yet here. It's the young Dustin Hoffman as Ben Braddock in the 1967 film The Graduate on a bus to who knows where. In the Celtic tradition, the figure associated with the threshold, with the in-between, is St. Bridget of Kildare. And because she dates back to the 5th and 6th centuries in Ireland, her biography is more legend than it is history. For instance, in Celtic lore, Bridget is said to have been the midwife to Christ, ushering him across the threshold from heaven to earth. Many of the stories surrounding her are infused with birthing symbolism, bringing new life into the world. In the Hebrides Islands, which are named for her, the name Bridget is invoked in the doorway at the birth of a child. In this way, every birth is understood to be a rebirth of Christ into the world. Today is the day in the United States, at least, that is set aside to celebrate the mothers who bring us into the world as well as the mothers who raise us, nurture us, and when needed, who give us a swift kick to get us moving. They aren't always the same person. Originally, it was conceived as an anti-war protest by mothers who had lost their children in the Civil War. But now, Mother's Day has become this complicated mix of sincere sentiment, opportune commercialized guilt, and unresolved trauma. It turns out that more than one thing can be true at the same time. Technically speaking, motherhood is the means by which each of us cross the threshold from non-being into being, but there's way more to it than that. And it can be fraught with pain, loss, and longing that comes from human biology, physiology, and families. Bridget is a good reminder that we need not create the birth to play a mothering role in the world, to help midwife all that God would bring into this world over whatever threshold we happen to find ourselves standing. All of which makes our reading this morning a little disappointing, if I'm being honest. Now, to be fair, just like the liberated Hebrew slaves, the disciples have the freedom, life, the joy of Jesus' resurrection, and absolutely no sense of direction. And as such, they do what most of us do, what the Hebrews did back on the other side of the Red Sea. They try to go back, in a manner of speaking. 
When Jesus was with them before Jerusalem, before crucifixion and resurrection, he appointed the twelve. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And of course, one of those twelve was no longer with them now. Sidebar here, this is one instance where I'm grateful that the lectionary abridges the reading for us. Usually, I feel like we've been, you know, shorted when they do that to us, that not including something. But in this case, we're spared the gory detail of Judas's demise at his own hand and the standard condemnation that comes with it. For the record, I like to imagine God extending far more grace to the failings of Judas than the biblical witness leaves room for, but that's a sermon for another day. The immediate problem, as Peter sees it, is that they're an apostle shy of 12. And 12 feels like an important number to them. After all, Israel was represented by its 12 tribes. Jesus chose 12. We need 12. This is often what happens in between. When the way things were is clearly not the way things are, and certainly not the way things are going to be, we cling to what we've known. We cling to what we've done in the past as though it's the standard going forward. It's also what happens when the church exists to satisfy its numbers without the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. Because Peter's criteria for filling the spot is that it has to be one of the men who has been with them since John's baptism all the way to the ascension. Two, and this is a quote, become witnesses with us to his resurrection. Are you seeing what might be problematic about that? And what happens? They put forward the names of two men. Excuse me? What? You want someone who will be a witness with you to the resurrection, and no one thinks to name any of the first three witnesses to that momentous event. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. Salome, if you're reading Mark. Hello? They're right there, Peter. Oh, but we've never done that before. So? Rather than satisfying the mission given to them by Christ himself, who regularly broke from patriarchal structures that subordinated women and kept them separate from men, Peter satisfies the form of the thing he knows. Does anyone really think that the mission of the church is determined or reliant on the gender of those called to lead and bear witness to the good news for all humanity. In fact, you would think that a gospel that serves the whole of humanity should be preached by people who represent the whole of that humanity. Now, as much as we want to celebrate mothers today, and I'm going to call my mom when this service is over, I sometimes wonder if we have either wittingly or unwittingly fallen into the trap that sidelines and treats women as if that is the only role they can or should play. And we overlook everything else they have to offer. Bridget would point us to the power of the sacred feminine that need not give birth to have a role in facilitating all that God bears into the world. To bear witness to the light that those women encountered on the first day of the week while it was still dark. I would like to say that the church has come to do better, and it has, than leaving its leadership up to the chance throwing of lots. But it can continue to do a better job of attending to the spirit that leads us into God's future instead of replicating what we've always done or known. In the in-between places of our lives, 
we can cast our eyes to what's ahead instead of what's behind us. We can open our hearts and our minds to the new thing God is trying to bring forth even now and to help usher it across the threshold as a whole new world opens to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand as together we say what we believe using the words of affirmation from our brief statement of faith printed in your worship order. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image male and female of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>